Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign, and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talk to Seb Abekasis. Seb is the creator of the YouTube channel, Not the BBC, which hosts fascinating discussions about the future of society and how we can build a fairer and more prosperous world in the absence of the legacy institutions which can no longer be trusted. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Seb, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we've already talked once before on your channel, not the BBC. So welcome to my podcast. Thanks, uh, thanks for agreeing to chat. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Great to be on. I really enjoyed our chat a few months ago. Since our last chat, I guess, why don't you just summarize where you see the world? Um, the last time we talked, just to kind of give a brief um, update for the people listening, is I guess we'd probably just... We just started coming out of lockdown, I think. Um, it was probably towards the end of spring. So we had this whole concept of Freedom Day, which I believe in the UK was somewhere around June. Um, and things were starting to open up again. But of course, we were both quite aware that that was going to be temporary. And anyone who's really been paying attention knew that that was just going to be a very temporary thing over summer and that we expected everything to return in the winter. So while many people were getting pretty excited about the concept of opening up, we were quietly pretty pessimistic about that and still um, hatching plans for how we were going <laughs> to how we were going to approach things when the lockdowns, etc. started coming back again. So why don't you just go through what's happened over the kind of last six to eight months and where we are now? Yeah, I don't think either of us one day any illusions that, you know, it was all going to be magic and we were going to go back and, you know, we, you know, the kind of bad days were over. It's been an interesting year. And, and definitely, I think earlier in the year, I was, you know, you're kind of thinking, you're realizing the extent of the, the malice that's kind of driving the decisions at the, at the public level. And so you know, I was kind of very, very concerned about where we were going. And, and I was kind of thinking by this time, you know, the kind of, they would have pushed out the vaccines and, and they would have really kind of, um, done their best to kind of get everyone fully vaccinated and the rest of it. And that's kind of happened to an extent, but um, I kind of now see it as more of a, of an inflection point. Like I, I, you know, people were talking about internment camps and stuff like that, you know, if we're thinking like back in January and February. Um, and certainly uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, it seemed that um, perhaps this is more of an inflection point. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to set a precedent for, for lockdowns for vaccines being solutions to, and you know, for vaccines being the only way out of different pandemics and different variants. And, and perhaps maybe we had like another five years um, or another, you know, another few years of, of kind of constant um, like clamping down until they sort of really try and um, kind of implement their system. So that was kind of the view I was coming towards. Um, and, you know, then you see the way that lots of NBA stars are speaking out about the vaccine um and that to me seemed really critical so that started getting me um feeling at least in the shorter term optimistic about where things are going because if you look at the way that the american empire has operated i mean the kind of soft power element of it is critical right if you look at the role that hollywood have in you know in promoting sort of like global globalist narratives open borders and the rest of it right um so you look at the role that kind of celebrities and stuff so when i started seeing nba stars speaking out in in very kind of measured ways in not really device divisive dumb ways um i was kind of thinking that they're really struggling to to keep hold of the narrative and and then you see them um, you see them shift over to to climate change just kind of overnight in, in quite an unnatural way and suddenly they're talking about we need to be on a war footing um when obviously it has been a constant theme then talking about the climate but it goes from like not being mentioned to suddenly prince charles talking about a war footing and the rest of it so start to think that okay maybe they're switching narratives maybe we've got kind of got a bit more breathing space let's say in the in the next 18 months and that's why i've been very very surprised that in the last week they've you know we've seen you know lockdowns only for the unvaccinated in austria we're hearing now about mandatory vaccines in in february i think germany now they're saying oh, are going to follow suit with austria and so 
that that did kind of, I will admit that did kind of surprise me because it seemed that things were sort of crumbling and you you know um and at the moment where they they're kind of pretty weak they suddenly go for perhaps the largest the biggest escalation that we've seen um so as as we speak right now I'm still kind of trying to make sense and trying to figure out what this all means but that's sort of the um the general take but you know generally feeling good at the, at the amount of people that have woken up and friends of mine who weren't giving me an inch six months ago certainly they're listening to to arguments now so I totally agree with that. In terms of what you were saying with the lockdowns happening again across Europe, it seems to me to be, it seems to me to really reek of desperation, actually. And I think that as, although we're kind of sitting here kind of wondering, why is this happening? It just doesn't really seem to be fitting. For me, that the reason for that is actually because there is desperation in the air and that they are kind of using their last ditch attempts to really um, push this thing over the line. And I actually feel that although we could kind of sit here and be very, um, not afraid, but we could sit here and be very disillusioned by everything that's going on and, and feel that, you know, maybe, maybe we were wrong and maybe this thing still does have a lot of strength and that the, I guess, our opposition and the governments, they could really pull this thing off. Mm. But the way that I see it is... Um, the desperation is really obvious to me. And I actually think that it's waking a lot of people up as they try to get increasingly draconian with their measures. A lot of people are waking up to uh, the craziness and kind of they're kicking a lot of people over to our team, especially here in the UK, where we're starting to hear this talk of um, that you have to have a booster now to be vaccinated. And I think last time we talked, the booster narrative hadn't really uh, started to emerge. And I know that people were talking about that quite early on. I actually yeah. never thought that, that was going to happen, the booster narrative. My belief was always that they wouldn't push the boosters for a number of years because they would want to keep people in the vaccinated character um, in the vaccinated category and they wouldn't want to push people over to the unvaccinated team because they were really drumming up their numbers. And now they're mm. about to take, you know, in the UK, um, what, 70% of people are now going to just be kicked back onto team unvax and they're going to have yeah. to, you know, the, the, the establishment is betraying the compliant. And that seems like a very odd thing to me. And the only way that I can quantify that or the only way that I can, I guess, understand it is from the perspective of there is this alliance between governments and big pharma. And it seems to me that their interests are not always aligned. It seems to me that governments mm. want power and big pharma want money. And big pharma are pushing the money side of things way too fast and way too strong. And it's undermining the power grab by government. So it's almost like the this unholy alliance now has different objectives that are starting to pull it all apart at the seams. I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, yeah, that, I mean, definitely on the initial premise that it's, it's kind of going to wake a lot of people up. I mean, the narrative just isn't there. I mean, so many people have really stomached the nonsense of the last 18 months, but even by what we've seen, this, the, the narrative that like, you know, that immediately, if you, if you don't, if you don't get another booster, um, you, you like your, you don't, you don't, you don't qualify as being vaccinated in such short time frames, or the fact that, um, you know, that you could do lockdowns, you could do lockdowns when the, when, People are saying now, even I think the CDC even said they spread them, you know, like uh, the vaccinated people actually do pass on COVID and stuff. So the narrative isn't even there. So it does, it, it is interesting to speak of desperation. And I think, yeah, um, it is interesting to consider how that works. You know, perhaps there's not really, you know, perhaps people in government, the admin people, I mean, I think of them as more mindless idiots than people who are um, kind of malicious, the people in in our in our government and so perhaps they've kind of reacted to what they're they're hearing the people say they're hearing the constituents say and they're kind of pushing back to the pharma companies but the pharma companies are the ones who ultimately call the shots and so maybe that's why we're seeing a little bit of like inconsistency in that um the kind of administrative people in the government are, are sort of kind of asking questions um and the pharma company yeah they don't know you know they don't know what, uh, what else to do other than just keep pushing their pushing their product so it could be to do with like a sort of disagreement in different factions, you know, between different factions. And we're seeing that at the level of the media now as well, where you're seeing people like GB News, who's definitely signed up with a very clear intent to push vaccines. If you looked at Andrew Neil, was straight on 
Um, and he's been pr- and he was their main guy and he was very, very, um, he was very blunt about the fact that people needed to be vaccinated and the fact that he kind of left and now they're kind of having Neil Oliver talk, you know, give really blunt takes. Um, it does seem that there are, there are sort of fractures appearing there. Um, my only concern is that it just seems a little bit too incompetent, <laughs> you know, to think it does seem just so dumb to do what they're doing. And we have to remember that these guys aren't idiots. I mean, they've gutted one of the greatest empires ever. Um, these financial powers have gutted the American empire <laughs> and completely indebted America. And so clearly they're pretty sophisticated. And so that's the one, that's the one kind of thing I try and remind myself when it seems I was for a lot, you know, for a long time until a couple of weeks ago, I was really kind of pushing the incompetence narrative and, and now I'm sort of just questioning that because I'm just like, this just seems a little bit too idiotic um, to just to kind of jump and do it now. Maybe they want us to turn on the, on the government. Um, I don't know, right? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what you were saying with regards to GB news and that kind of thing, I've always thought that one of the positive signs would be when the rats start to flee the shipwreck. And um, is that the term? <laughs> I don't um, know if that's the right term. I think, yeah, it's functional enough anyway. (laughs) Yeah, it'll do, it'll do. But it does seem that we're starting to see that now. I mean, one of the interesting things that I saw recently was um, Bill Gates starting to kind of shed doubts about the vaccine, which I just thought, this is the last guy on the planet. I mean, this guy has been evangelizing vaccines for as long as, you know, I can remember. And now he's saying that, you know, the vaccines aren't effective enough. It's not, we're not going to be able to get through this with vaccines alone. We need these other measures. We need other therapeutics. He even, I think, used the word therapeutics, which was mind blowing to hear from someone like Bill Gates. Mm. And it seems to me like perhaps some of these people are starting to see the writing on the wall and are starting to um, distance themselves from their actions and from the narrative. And at some point, I think it could be that enough people, that there's a kind of critical mass of people who distance themselves from that narrative, at which point everybody will be flooding for the exits and nobody will want anything to do with it. And everyone will pretend we never wanted to do lockdowns. I want, I never wanted to do this. Yeah. You know, I never pushed the vaccine. I was just listening to the experts, etc. And it does feel like we're dangerously, well, not so dangerously close to that time. Well, yeah, pe- people might be, they're kind of putting their, they're hedging, right? They're kind of putting their little safety nets out there, their comments that they can go, that they can fall back to, uh, that they can fall back on. Um, I mean, yeah, qu- quite possibly. And it's it was also interesting, you know, Pfizer coming out with a pill. I kind of found that interesting. They were talking about how much it reduced hospitalization and stuff. And you're, tr- you're trying to figure out, like, if you are trying to really just take the narrowest road to push, get as me- deeper penetration with vaccinations as you can, a lot of it doesn't seem to to make sense, but definitely like that's what you see happen. And then what happens is they find someone to scapegoat, right? So they kind of, seems they kind of did that a little bit with Fauci in America, like when they started talking about it might have escaped from a lab and stuff and it wasn't the wet market. It's, you don't hear so much from him. And so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a maybe a leading indicator that things are slipping when you, and that's why earlier in the year, I really didn't bother. Um, I really tried to shut off mainstream media because I just, felt so sick of it but actually it's really quite informative if you can kind of start listening to it dispassionately because they you know they're always kind of seeding things they're always seeding ideas they're programming us in subtle ways but then also they are kind of from their own perspectives they're sort of covering their own backs and so yeah when you see people like Gates saying that when you consider how hard line particularly when you consider how hard line some of the perspectives were on vaccines it's sorry like it's all we've got and it's the only way uh, it, it does seem quite significant. Yeah. But again, that's why I said I was so surprised. It's just so interesting at this point where you have the Pfizer pool, you have Gates saying that. Um, you have a bunch of people waking up and they suddenly go like, yeah, you're, it's, it's, it's lockdowns for the, you know, for the unvaccinated in Austria. Um, and obviously they've now kind of backtracked, but now they're still, they, from what I understand, the vaccine, the mandatory vaccinations for February is still there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it is it's curious, isn't it? It seems to me the mandatory vaccination thing is very unlikely to actually come to fruition, but it seems like just another push, just another kind of nudge to get people to take this vaccine. It, I mean, it really is almost, I guess it really is the absolute end of the line. I mean, you can't really say anything. Once you say, you know, you are breaking the law by not taking the vaccine, where do you go from there? So it seems like we are kind of at the end of the line and there's still so many people who are unvaccinated. My 
interpretation is that they probably had a figure in mind of how many people they needed to get vaccinated Mm. before which point um, everybody who remained was essentially irrelevant and that they could just deal with those people uh, whatever um, by whatever means they deem necessary. And it seems to me that they expected a much higher uptake. I think a lot more people have um, detected the lies than they expected. Mm. And maybe that's wishful thinking on my part, but you are not going to pull this off with a 70 to 75% vaccination rate, which is about as good as it's looking in Europe at the moment, Um, especially when you're now kicking um, millions of people back onto team unvaccinated with the booster um, agenda. It appears to me that there's just far too much resistance going to come now for them to actually get this over the line. Well, that's what I was wondering early in the year with how, you know, when you're looking at how hard they're pushing it, I was kind of thinking, yeah, maybe they're, they're, maybe it's a target they have, or maybe they're thinking in terms of like a critical mass, like the more people that are vaccinated, the more people then have a sort of emotional disposition against others remaining unvaccinated, right? They're kind of committed now and they kind of feel, and if they kind of subconsciously realize they cocked up, well, they kind of want other people to cock up in the way that they did. So I was kind of wondering if, if that was partly it, is that the more, if they just really push it hard, get over the critical mass, and then that will just create it would just kind of enable more and more societal pressure and more and more people to, to turn on others. So um, definitely, definitely very possible. And, and maybe this is just like the end of their checklist of things to do is and at the end of the road, we, we make it mandatory. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe it's, a, you know, maybe it's a sign that they're kind of thinking about other stuff, but where like forcing vaccinations are concerned, um, you know, they'll do the mandatory vaccine and they put that line out there and then that's that done. And maybe they then switch to, Okay, now we're going to kind of find other ways to to get compliance. We're going to kind of ramp up the. We're going to make sure we're kind of bulletproof in the climate emergency narrative and start start thinking about how we frame climate lockdowns. Um, definitely possible, but no. The point also the point you make about turning people who are vaccinated into being unvaccinated. Like this has just happened with people in my family, and they were they were texting, said you know a few weeks ago testing each other, saying, "Oh, I'm free now. I got my second dose." Um, so then to sudden that is going to be an immensely bitter pill to swallow and it's going to make people feel betrayed and lied to, uh, which again, seems utterly kind of dumb and incompetent. Um, and so, yeah, there's two ways to, there's two ways to interpret that. The first one is they really underestimated us and there is something really powerful that happens when people wake up and there's sort of, you know, um, the sort of global awakening or, um, whatever, I forget what the, yeah the awakening era i forget what we're calling it but you know that side of things or the other one is that um they kind of yeah that they are and so it kind of slipped away from them the other one is that perhaps it's a little more clever than that and what they want us to do is they want us to really turn on our national governments um to find you know really direct our anger towards scapegoats and then some kind of new heroic people are going to emerge and say like oh yeah we got rid of those chumps who did that um, something I'm kind of exploring at the moment. Um, it was actually some sort of one of those anon posts that I saw, um, and I take those with, really take those with a pinch of salt. Basically, it was basically saying that um, oh, we're gonna essentially the goal is to have everyone turn on the national governments, and then a kind of world government will emerge. And I really don't, after seeing the nonsense around QAnon, I really don't tend to take those seriously. But a mate of mine said I just find the kind of the logic here interesting, and and so yeah, when I've started seeing these dumb moves. <laughs> what seemingly dumb moves now that we can't quite make sense of, which seem to just be incendiary. Uh, I'm kind of starting to just entertain, or at least I'm trying to run that scenario in my head and kind of see how how does that all fit together. I guess my approach with that is that, well, even if that is the case, we can't necessarily um, preempt that. So mm. we should cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, my belief is that we still need to continue this battle through to the end with our national governments. And Mm. if this kind of global government solution emerges to, you know, quote unquote, set us all free, then we need to be hyper aware to that, which we absolutely will be. And I'm sure that that is a threat that we can also see off because for me, there's too many people who are awake, generally speaking. So whether it's a national government or if the EU comes to the rescue or if, you know, a global government comes to the rescue or whoever it might be, I think that people will be very, very, um, aware and in people will be what's the word i'm looking for people will be 
looking out for that, especially after the past two years, people will be ready to fight that battle should it they, emerge. They won't be they won't be as naive, yeah. No, and, and I, I do agree what you say in terms of like in terms of what the implications are or anything like that. It doesn't make any sense, right? We still need to we still need to stand up. We still need to push back against these infringements and we still need to give ourselves breathing space. Um, and ultimately and at the same time we also don't want we also want to keep our heads, right? Um, and so you know when that's happening when they, if it, let's assume they're trying to make people turn on their national governments that's that's going to be a time to keep your heads even now in this kind of context we don't want to do anything too rash too dumb because that's exactly what turns public opinion against us right like things are we have the moral high ground right now um particularly for the that kind of like those marginal people who are coming over to our side and as soon as you start doing dumb stuff as soon as you start getting rash as soon as you start getting violent even if let's say if it's justified, right? It's still, I don't think it's particularly smart strategy. And it and given how adverse the average person is to anything threatening, and we've seen how they've reacted to to the virus, to you know, to kind of risks of a virus, like it will just kind of inc- you know, just kind of turn probably against us and build a narrative for them to clamp down on us harder. So yeah, I think regardless of like the bigger picture, and yeah, I do try and kind of think in these terms in terms of like separating speculating about what's happening with practical action i agree with you like it it doesn't really have to impact what we do like we need to stand up and we need to be strategic and we need to be smart and we need to ultimately appeal to like a higher kind of morality and a higher consciousness so one of the words that you used before was incompetent and that's a word that we've heard a lot in particular from our kind of supposed alternate news networks um i just want to try and understand in what context you're using that because i actually think that What's happening a lot is that people are suggesting that there's a kind of dichotomy that either the governments are incompetent or that they're conspiratorial and they're all in on it. But I actually think that they can be both. And we Mm. should, if anything, we should expect them to be both because governments are fundamentally incompetent because these centralised powers that try to do grandiose things never actually achieve them. I mean, throughout history, we've had time and time again, governments wanting to do huge things and um, had... um, these aspirations of grandeur, which never actually are achievable, by, especially by governments. I mean, it's hard enough to achieve, generally speaking, but governments are the worst institutions to possibly try to do these things. So it seems to me that both are true. The There is mm. a global conspiracy. There is a global, I don't even know necessarily whether conspiracy is the right word, but there is an agenda which yeah. many different governments, whether or not they have all come together and agreed on it, there seems to be something tying together the there's action. some sort of direction exactly so i believe that they're both um there is an agenda but there's also complete incompetence and that's what we're seeing now we're seeing that those two things manifest themselves um so when you use the word incompetent what do you mean by that i mean i mean i guess in terms of like the in terms of the decision making um i agree with you so i think that the average person in the government is somewhat incompetent but that doesn't mean that there is not some kind of unifying agenda and there isn't some kind of conspiracy but I, I kind of mean it less on the on the level of the people of the government and more on the level of the people who are kind of let's say who have an agenda right who i think we can broadly agree are financial powers who are trying to they're trying to concentrate their control over the west resources i would say that's kind of the unifying thing and it's not a particularly clever conspiracy or i mean it's not a particularly like fanciful thing to think that a bunch of very powerful financiers are trying to kind of um, consolidate their control. So yeah, when I see incompetent, I kind of mean more in terms of whoever's setting the decisions, because we know it's not our government. Um, that you know, we know they're kind of to some degree following orders. And we mentioned with talking about Big Pharma, that there's probably some kind of dialogue there. But still, it seems that like in terms of what's going on, um, in terms of the kind of sequencing of things, in terms of choosing to ramp down now, I would say more it would seem that, that that's kind of um, happening more at the level of, of whoever, whatever powers are really orchestrating this. But um, yeah, I think it's really important to distinguish between that. Like, I think um, they are, in order to enable this level of complete apathy at the, at the governmental level and our institutions to collapse like this, you need a certain level of incompetence, right? You need, they, they select people who are glib, they select people who aren't principled. I've got a friend who used to work, he used to um, advise the Tory government. And he said that 
when you know in selection tests that anyone who could think for themselves he, he was he could very clearly he was pretty awake at that stage and he could very clearly see how in, when they're selecting who's going to come through they like people who are team players and anyone who had showed too much kind of like dis, of too much of a disagreeable nature was not selected right um it kind of graded against that so definitely there are, um, I think there probably are filters in place to ensure a degree of incompetency and glibness. Um, and I think it's worth differentiating between that and people who are operating at the level of like the propaganda, operating at the level of, um, let's say, perhaps more the kind of health side of things, um, and also operating at the level of the financial uh, warfare um, that's being waged on us. So I kind of um, differentiate between those. But yeah, with regard to my common it seemed to me more like the higher stratum of people like the davos level is a bit more incompetent than the westminster level because i i is yeah the, the westminster level i think we can all agree and we've known for, de- for a couple of decades now is, is is pretty useless yeah so i'm really glad that you brought that up actually because one of the things i was going to talk to you about is this difference there seems to be in society there seems to be two sections of people and one section um seem to be kind of awake to what's going on and aware of the lies and the deception and other people seem to be um, accepting of it and whether or not they necessarily agree with everything they kind of roll with the punches and they'll go through the motions and they don't seem to think that there's anything that we should be too particularly concerned about and that this is all just going to blow over and I'm interested to know um, what do you think separates these two groups of people what are the characteristics that put some people into the category where we feel like we are fighting for the f- the future or the freedom of humanity and this other group that just think oh well you know this is just uh, a pandemic and we're just dealing with it and there's going to be a response and we just have to get the vaccine and just go along with it and everything will be all right to me, the most obvious one is where is kind of where you sit um, socially, right? So I think that um, people who are kind of, I guess, a lot of people who are who are dissidents and who are kind of awake to what's going on, I think a lot of them, if you look back at their history, they never they never perhaps like fit in quite as well as other people. And I think what that does is it gives you an incentivize to criticize the system. So automatically, you're kind of looking out for things to to hold, right? So I think like that's kind of my more like bluntly honest i think a lot of us we like to think we're all super independent minded but if you look back it's a quite common thread that for whatever reason things didn't quite work out for you or, or not necessarily didn't work out for you but let's say like um like my parents come from very different backgrounds and so i kind of never sh- i was always kind of looking in from the outside right um or you have yeah you have other people who, who yeah who didn't identify with their peers or whatever and then on the flip side i think people who are um, let's say who they're kind of much more nested in the, in the system. They kind of had a much more obvious sense of belonging. Um, they were really profiting from the system. I think it's a complete opposite effect from you know from the you know it's a complete opposite thing for them, where they kind of they kind of have been empowered by the status quo and they're incentivized to um, to keep you know to keep believing. And so for them to kind of for us to say it, turn around and say this whole system is a sham. Is, is to kind of you know, attack their ego a little bit and is to kind of say like actually the whole system the whole sense of um, self-worth your whole like your whole ego the value that you kind of attribute to yourself a lot of that is um is nonsense and you're not actually as great as you think you know as you think you are so i do think like i and i think you see that um you see that a fair bit and that's kind of like a common thread so that's kind of one of the main ones that, that, that i would put it down to but yeah definitely it's um you know, we're all different and some people are, are more inclined to think independently. But that's the kind of the main thing. And that to me ties in with why the liberals and the lefties um, are so on board with it. That's my that's my thesis as well. It's that they have been empowered by the system. They're kind of getting all the wins for the last sort of like 40, 50 years. They've, they've really had a good run of it. And to then turn around and say like, actually this establishment that has been promoting your goals, even though you keep shouting at it, I think subconsciously they're aware this establishment that's, you know, that's doing that is actually super corrupt. Um, and I think it's sort of like, they're sort of, they don't want to admit that um, it's the source of their power. And that's why they're kind of going along with it. Um, whereas like the old school lefties who, uh, you know, the old school working class lefties who have been left behind or like the Brexit types, they're already looking at the system from the outside. They already are under no illusions that the, that the people in Westminster, the people who run things really give a shit about them. Um, and so 
they are already disaffected. And so I don't think they have any kind of beer goggles on. Um, that's, you know, that's the main, that's the main thing I have that I have in mind. And then obviously it's just like people in your personal life. And I think some people, yeah, it's just like the more, yeah, some people just happy, are just lucky that they had someone in their personal life who was, who was awake and who they trusted. Um, and to kind of at least, and who managed to sort of help them see a bit more clearly. Interesting. Yeah. It does seem to me that being a contrarian is probably one of the biggest things that I can see. It's, you know, people who have, who are, I guess, open to the idea that governments lie, even just something like that. That said, it does seem that there's many people who, for instance, recognize that, you know, the Iraq war was based on a load of lies who seem completely unable to comprehend the concept that this might also have been based on a load of lies. And, you know, the people, if we remember back then, um, you know, I remember quite clearly that people were saying things like, oh, well, you have to trust the experts. This is what the weapons detectors are saying. The weapons detectors are saying there's there's weapons of mass destruction. Trust the experts. We need to go in, etc. And now we're hearing, you know, the exact same things. Trust the experts. And people are saying, oh, well, you know, experts have never been wrong. Well, I remember during the Iraq war when the supposed experts were completely and unequivocally wrong. And I'm just mm. surprised that people have such short memory spans. There's, yeah, I mean, there is, it's pretty inconsistent logically to to kind of not infer from that perspective that people who are making decisions in government could be, um, you know, could be wrong, right? Could be, could be unreliable. Um, and so... Yeah, it's 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 interesting to to understand why this. I mean, I tend to think it's more it's it's let you know the reason element of it is is kind of very secondary to um, the kind of broader like tribal impulses that you have. And so I think whenever um, so a lot of it depends on like you know what the yeah it's, a lot of it's less in terms of um, the the reason and the logic of it, um, and they're much more engrossed in uh, in sort of what they who the who, what the people that they hate think and you know, what the people that they trust and the people that they identify with believe. Um, and I think perhaps if this had happened sooner to the Iraq war, when it was fresher in the memory, uh, maybe people would, would think differently, but I think we've just reached a point where things are so tribal. Um, and this has been one of the biggest effects of Trump and Brexit that it's just super hard, I think, for people to kind of revert back to that reason. And so, and maybe, you know, and so this is why you wonder, maybe, maybe it was planned because people have like, if we hadn't had the last five years, which you just literally, you know, put a dagger down the middle of society, perhaps we would have not been thinking in these really kind of extreme terms in, in this extreme tribalism. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of put it down to that, but it's definitely interesting. And I think that's ultimately kind of how you want to try and kind of break people free is you try and make them realize that yes, the government are capable of that um, because people are kind of always in these, under these illusions, like, Oh, we're the people, it's democracy. We're in charge. Therefore nothing terrible can happen. Um, and I think kind of people hide behind that. And so definitely in terms of like dismantling the, the mental model that people have and kind of giving them a, a very, a very kind of uncontroversial example of when the government did something bad should work. And it has worked and it does work. To, it, to some degree but like you said not as much as you might think and it seems that there's kind of other things uh maybe fear maybe hate um maybe kind of self-interest like i said for the for the liberals who feel like empowered and they kind of want to feel like the the status quo the established interests have some kind of <laughs> worth and aren't completely corrupt um yeah yeah another thing that seems evident to me and I don't know whether this is deliberate or whether it just happens to have kind of coincided with what we're seeing now, is this kind of real rise in kind of wokeism. And I'm sure a lot of people look at the whole wokeism thing. And generally, if you're anti-woke, you're going to be, for instance, anti-lockdown, you're going to be, um, you know, anti-mandating vaccines, etc. And some people might think, well, how are these things connected? But I actually don't I actually think it makes perfect sense why they're connected because the people who have really subscribed to the kind of um woke the, the kind of woke religion these people have been espousing views for a long time of you know everything that you do it's all for some minority group everything you know we've got to always be um doing this because this group is disenfranchised or this group is 
uh, being systemically, um, what's the word? Systemically uh, oppressed or oppressed, oppressed exactly. So we're hearing, we've been hearing this stuff for quite a long time. And now it seems to have just shifted. So with the whole vaccine narrative, for instance, even though most people would accept, well, you don't need to give the vaccine to children, for example, um, or even really anyone, I would say, below the age of 70. But let's just focus on children for now. And it's almost like these same narratives have now been weaponized in this debate so that it's like, well, we've got to give the vaccine to children because if children have it, then you can save granny. And you say, well, the, ch the child doesn't need it. And the answer is, oh, well, it's not for the child. It's to save granny, et cetera, mm. which to me seems like one of the most disgusting things that you could ever advocate in society. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship free platforms. But because yeah. we've kind <laughs> of been fed this propaganda for a long time about, you know, pr protecting um, this, that or the other group, it seems like we're kind of now saying, oh, well, we've now got to protect the vulnerable. The vulnerable is now the group of the day or the elderly is now it's the new group, which uh, the whole of the, the, the whole of society has to collectively come together to save, in a sense. And I'm interested to know your thoughts on that and whether you see that same link there. I definitely see it uh, in like in the way that they have tried to kind of enforce and tried to kind of ramp up the the amount of people that are vaccinated, right? The vaccination rates. Uh, you know, one of the main themes that we've seen over the last, you know, since kind of, um, I guess, the end of the Second World War is we've really seen, you know, since the kind of liberal, um, the, you know, the liberalism has really flourished is you've seen empathy be, we you know, be weaponized, uh, which is kind of one of the most immoral things you can do is sort of, you know, take people's, um, take people's kind of goodwill and they're concerned for others, and they're kind of one of the most, one of the best parts of humanity, <laughs> and kind of making that, and kind of confusing these people, and making them sort of like use that in, in a, you know, for 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 your own ends or for ends that are are kind of like rock, completely wrong. Um, so I definitely think that's been one of the ways they've done it, right? And it's all always been about kind of protecting the vulnerable, and we've always tried to help out with the smaller parts of society and people who have been left behind and stuff like that. So. I would agree that they've like it's been more weaponized empathy. Um, I wouldn't necessarily think that's why um, in the first place people are people are kind of going along with it because you could, for example, um, if you look at the um, like the the vaccination rates in in kind of minority ethnic groups and stuff like that, they're a lot lower, and a lot of these people have religious concerns about that, and they have religious um, reasons to not be for it. And so, you know, from that perspective, you might think that these kind of wokies, they would say like, well, don't don't step on their toes. Don't step on their toes, big farmer. Like these people should be, um, these people should be free to have their own decision. So it seems like it's a mechanism that they've used um, to kind of, to kind of sway public opinion and definitely helps explain like how woke people have been manipulated and stuff. Um, I, yeah, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I, I would need to think about whether it like that's a, clear you know clear explanation for why the woke people back it kind of in the first place right yeah i guess to quantify it in terms of how i see this is essentially if you get people thinking upon a certain line of thinking which in this case is you are selfish if you don't repent for whatever it is and previously it's been you know you have to repent for being white because you know you are, are privileged etc you have to repent for being, for instance, male because we live in a patriarchy, et cetera. And there's all of this kind of laundry list of, or, or I guess this hierarchy of, you know, who needs to repent. And it seems like this very same um, or similar thinking is now being applied to vaccinated and unvaccinated, which is that if you're unvaccinated, you are somehow selfish and you're, you know, oppressing others in whatever way or you're not thinking about others. And it just seems almost to, yeah. it, whether or not the whole woke thing was was deliberate for this purpose. I'm not saying that it is, but I guess it's more that we've kind of trained ourselves in collectivist thinking. And now that collectivist thinking is being very squarely applied to this particular issue. Um, I mean, definitely in terms of kind of pointing out privilege and, um, and kind of attacking kind of 
people from a supposed position, a position of privilege not kind of um, putting their, you know, basically kind of putting their interests first or kind of not at least completely decimating their interests, um, you know, kind of to, to favour another group. That's definitely been part of the part of the mechanism. I'm, I'm kind of careful with the, with the with the collectivism because I think in some degrees they're pushing collectivism think collectivist thinking. But then if you look at the way that they're attacking um, like nationalism and they're attacking kind of Christianity and you're attacking kind of more organic senses of belonging, they seem to have a pretty strong emergent kind of allergic reaction to that. Um, so uh, I think it kind of I think the collectivism thing um, kind of works both ways. And the way I kind of I take it is they're trying to um, yeah they're kind of they're trying to break our kind of organic. Uh, they're trying to make us think uh, they're trying to make us distrust those around us um, and not kind of identify with those around us. And then they're trying to kind of then make us kind of like put our interests second to some to some kind of like fraudulent hole that doesn't make any sense by um by kind of appealing to well firstly by attacking any kind of actually coherent group in society that has any power um and yeah and sec yeah and secondly by by kind of making us um by weaponizing that empathy that we have for people who we have all seen in our eyes we've all seen minorities take shit and have racism and we've seen women be oppressed and we've seen awful stuff we've seen kind of homosexuals have kind of awful stuff be bullied at school and stuff like that so we kind of all we all seen that and we all we all know it's a problem and so they've definitely kind of um they've definitely kind of pulled that out of us and 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 made us um and yeah they've kind of triggered that those sentiments in us um but i think they are also very averse they are very kind of against us thinking in terms of collectives and that's one thing they don't want. So, I yeah, I kind of tend to think in a slightly different way about collectivism. I kind of think in terms of like organic collectivism and then like kind of fraudulent collectivism, which is just when they just like mesh a bunch of kind of confused individual, radicalized and confused individuals together, which is kind of more where we are now. Yeah, I like that term that you just used there, weaponizing our empathy. I definitely think that that, has occurred and i would agree i would agree somewhat with what you're saying there in terms of that there is some collective forms of collectivism that they like and some forms of collectivism that they don't like but it does seem to me like this form of collectivism is almost a kind of unquestioning well we have to just surrender completely to the emotive messages we're being given and we can't ask any questions about that so yeah. for instance we're being told and a very similar thing occurred during the lockdowns. We all remember during the lockdowns that they used to say, well, if it saved just one life, and when you would say, well, wait a second, um, what about all the lives that are being lost because people don't have access to healthcare? What about all of the lives that will be lost because someone goes into poverty or someone you know, loses their job and commits suicide or whatever the reason is for that? And the answer was, shut up and don't talk about it. You know, you're only allowed to care about lives lost uh, to coronavirus in this very narrow way of viewing things. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. And it seems very strange to me that people have totally just sucked this up. Although, to be mm. fair, I do, I do get the impression recently that it's starting to wane, that this... Um, thinking this kind of what I would call, I guess, blind collectivist thinking, whereby it's from mm. purely one angle and it's a kind of dogmatic form of collectivism. It is starting to wane and people are starting to find their voice a little bit and say, no, you know, I don't want to be treated uh, unfairly. I don't want my rights taken away because you tell me that this group is oppressed. I, you know, I, I want to be a free individual. I want to make informed choice, etc." Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, look, when in, you know, we I think we all we all are kind of suckers to collectivist me collectivist messaging because we're sort of tribal beings, right? And so we've kind of evolved to have you know we've evolved for kind of individual survival, but also for group survival. And so I think that explains why things like greater good really kind of appeal to us. But now at the same time, if the kind of tribe leaders, the government, um, who are telling you who, are, who you know if they're seen as like benevolent benevolent and they kind of identify and you identify with them and they're helping you out then when they kind of use that messaging 
right? Then you kind of, then you're much more likely to go through. But when you start to distrust the government, you start to get a sense of coercion, um, then it completely switches the whole narrative. And then you don't see them as your kind of tribe leaders. You start seeing them as like a enemy tribe, right? You kind of distrust them. Um, and so I think there's always, there always needs to be that kind of like that sort of narrative and that sort of like moral equity that the leaders have if any of this stuff greater good stuff is going to work and this is why they're quite yeah they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot because as soon as you start to get that sense of coercion then then you start to look out for yourself right a lot more and you start to realize that you um you start to kind of be much more distrustful um and that's it seems that what we're seeing and it's also it's a bit kind of um, self-defeating making everyone in society distrust and hate each other and then asking them to sacrifice themselves for them <laughs> um and so maybe that's kind of playing into it as well a little bit. Definitely. So I just want to touch a little bit on where you see the protest movement going and where we're up to now, because obviously we're both currently in the UK and we're from the UK. And it seems to me like things have definitely dropped off in terms of the UK protest movement. Understandably so, because right now I would say we're probably the most free country in Europe, which is quite crazy to say. I'm not sure whether you'd necessarily agree with that, but it seems to me that um, right now, aside from some travel rules, so for instance, having to quarantine uh, if you're unvaccinated when you come back into the country versus not having to quarantine if you are vaccinated, that seems to be really one of the only restrictions here. Aside from that, there's no vaccine passports. I was very surprised to see when I came back here to the UK, nobody's wearing masks, not even um, staff in, for instance, restaurants and uh, things like that, or bars. There's no masks really being mm. worn. There's relatively low mask use in supermarkets. So the UK, I can understand why the um, protest movement seems to have subdued a little bit. Um, if that changes, I fully expect it to return. But I'm interested to know your thoughts on what's going on with the kind of protest movement, both in the UK and also internationally. Yeah, something that I, I, I still never... I've always understood intuitively the need to go and I've always felt the sort of compulsion to go. Um, you know, I've, I've still always, I've, I've kind of struggled to fully grasp kind of what the role is, right? So I understand on some, like how, exactly how to think about it um, because like, clearly if you get a protest out every week and the energy, the energy discipline, you know, you might have, you might have kind of put more people out on mass, so kind of on, on an aggregate by the end of the year. But have you, uh, but what was it, you know, what was the end result of that? So I guess, you know, you need to kind of try and think of like, what is it to do? Is it to send a message? Is it to kind of galvanize people? Is it to energize people? Is it to bring people over? Is it to sort of like make kind of policemen and the marginal person in these institutions? I know the media aren't sharing it, but police officers on duty kind of see a bunch of non loonies out there. Is it about, you know, kind of really being energized? Is it about, you know, what, you know, what exactly is about and how to think about it? So, I think um, something I, you know, something I do spend time thinking about, and kind of more recently, I, I do think a lot of it comes down to just demonstrating that we have, that we do care, that we have the will, right? A lot of this kind of dissident fight back is happening on social media, and I think they're perfectly happy for that to happen, you know, for us to kind of just spend our time shouting on the internet. So it is important to have that interface with some kind of real boots on the ground because I think that's ultimately what this is about, right? Um, you know, like you know, kind of soil and, and earth and, and, and the rest of it. So um, I, I do see the importance of share, sending a message. And in terms of where it's going, I think, you know, we've had, yeah, we, we were so shocked early in the year. And I think nothing until recently really kind of acted as a trigger point to really get people off the off their asses. Um, and so you'd expect some, and I think there, there would have been a big one on the weekend after the Austria movements. Um, so... So yeah, it, it, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not actually too sure. It's not something that I'm, I feel the sharpest on. I think that ultimately, um, we need to keep doing it. We need to keep keeping our spirits up. We need to keep sending a message. Um, but it is gonna, it is gonna waver, right? Like you can't, um, you know, you, you need to manage people's energy um, to some degree. And um, perhaps yeah, the reason it quieted down is that we've kind of already seen, we've already been quite shocked at how bad it was and that's why you saw these really passionate you know marches early in the year and then it kind of fizzled out a bit so always when when the you know when they kind of like tighten the screws you're going to have people out into force but i'm always more interested in what happens after the protest 
and actually translating that into building infrastructure, like building networks, focusing on the media, thinking a bit longer term and translating all the energy that's kind of harnessed by bringing people together. Um, Cause I think you can't really galvanize people better than you can getting them all out there in Hyde Park and stuff like that. But once that energy is harnessed, that, that's kind of more what I'm concerned about is like how, what, what's the output of all that energy? If that output of all that energy is for us to go and shout on social media for a few, you know, for 20% of us to turn up to the next March until something bad happens again and not actually kind of build anything real uh, and build anything. Yeah. Like build any sort of pa- contribute to building a power structure, contribute to building, you know, infrastructure institutions, um, getting involved in crypto, getting involved in new media, um, starting political parties, helping, you know, getting more, you know, getting more active in your local community, um, meeting like minds around the world, all that kind of stuff. That's what I think is much more um, important than, um, I think that straddling that with having kind of, let's say once monthly or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever the timeframes are, very passionate, intense uh, marches is, is kind of, I think the way forward. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's, as I was saying to you before, before we started recording, that is exactly the reason why I decide, decided to start this is because mm. I want to allow people a kind of space to have longer form discussions, which hopefully um, take people away from platforms like Twitter, which are a little bit more impersonal and can actually help to have longer form discussions that people can tune into and really share ideas that are a bit more fleshed out. So mm. on that note, um, what are the things that you think that we should be doing as individuals, obviously outside of uh, protesting, that you think are going to really help this kind of movement to progress? Because I call this a cultural, <laughs> I call this a countercultural movement, if I can say that word, um, and uh, I really think that this will be looked back on as one of, if not the greatest countercultural counter-cultur- movement ever seen because this time we have digital tools at our disposal and I feel Mm. like we're up against a common enemy which is very powerful and it's causing us all to really build bridges so what are the things we should be doing and where do you see that whole movement going well I think we need to think from the ground up um, and build as much resilience as you can at the at the local level like if you kind of take stock of where we are we are part of this enormous global system. This, all, we've got all these global supply chains. We've got all these corporations. We've got all this huge infrastructure and, you know, all these, you know, the political apparatus and stuff like that, which to the average person, we're so far from taking control of. We're so far from being able to influence and we're so far from being able to understand. Um, and that's kind of a big source of the power, right? Like we've kind of, we've kind of outsourced an understanding of healthcare like of, of, of kind of immune systems and the rest of it. I mean, now we're literally outsourcing it to Pfizer, right? But before that, right, we kind of, everyone's thinking, everyone's kind of forgotten the importance of sunlight and stuff like that. At the a level of food, if we have supply shortages, I mean, it should be the most natural thing for a human to understand, to be able to feed themselves, even like fucking cucumber, right? For like, for a month, right? So they should, you know, it should be pretty standard for a human to not starve to death, Um and we don't have any control of this, right? It's all, we're, we're reliant on Tesco and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not some kind of utopian thing that overnight we're going to turn up and we're going to kind of build fully independent communities. But I think it's about taking the steps in that direction. Um, and the more, and the kind of, so building, you know, so from that perspective, like you want to build resilience, you therefore need to build a, a network of people in your local area who across kind of different core competencies can help you out, right? So you might have someone who understands investing a bit you might have someone who understands food you might have someone who understands healthcare you might have someone who can um who understands like education right people don't want to send their kids anymore to to kind of get radicalized um at schools so i think you want to be thinking in those terms um and i think one of the benefits is the kind of more you do that the more you make it easy for the marginal person to to come across right i think like the average person if they're faced with like okay i'm not subconsciously i'm very skeptical of, of what's going on I'm skeptical of this narrative but like all i have is a bunch of loonies and i'm going to starve and i'm not going to be able to get food and if i don't get the jab if i don't get the eighth booster i'm not going to be able to do live normal life then it makes it so much harder for that person that you know we're always making trade-offs in our head and it makes it so much harder for that person if there's just no functional alternative for them to fall back on 
So I think not only does it kind of help you and the people around you, um, but it will kind of help generally kind of grow the movement, right? And from that perspective, I, I kind of want to see a bit more of a positive vision. Um, I want to see people give give some, people something exciting to get behind, right? They just think we're sort of like loonies who believe all sorts of nutty stuff. But actually, you know, pretty much, I think what we're all aligned on is we're kind of against this massive, imp- these are massive impersonal structures. We're against like kind of GMO food. We're against destroying the environment, right? We don't believe in the kind of climate change climate emergency nonsense but we don't think that the ecological environment should be completely destroyed so that people can like have can eat snickers and do stuff like that right so i think we need yeah i'd like to see more of that i'd like to see people i think ultimately that will be a great unifying thing we kind of ultimately want to kind of go back to nature a bit more we want to go back to a simple a simpler way of living we have amazing technology which can help tackle some of these marginal cost issues which kind of you know you know kind of created an imperative for integration in the past and so yeah i i kind of think that's the way to think about it rather than like stressing about getting a man in westminster um and like taking control of the political process i i I don't want to lose sight of the political process completely um but i think yeah like the only way that you kind of get nearer to that is you create you create resilience outside of the system um so that's kind of the main that's what I would, I'd, I'd like to see more of. And I think we're starting to see a bit more of that. I think people are starting to kind of mobilize a bit. And that's why I like, the, that's why I like what I like about the crypto space is that it's full of, you know, it's people who are dissidents who are doers. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of why I think, and I think you've mentioned that you kind of want to see more of an interface between the kind of Bitcoiners um, and the freedom movement. And I think, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense because essentially you want to surround yourself with doers who share the same values yeah and one of the things that i see is happening in that world is that people actually are opting out and i agree that that's exactly what needs to happen and i do think it is happening because there's very few people who are actually talking about oh well when the next election comes what are we going to do who are we going to vote for you know very early on in this people were saying oh well the elected the next general elections four years away you know um who are we how are we going to get out of this who's going to be our candidate and really those conversations aren't happening anymore i think everyone recognizes that we just need to opt out altogether that system you know the solutions are not going to come from the system that provided us the problems so we do actually need to come together and to become more self-sovereign and become more communal and more local and uh, approach solutions on a personal level one of the things i find really interesting is that you know, we're always hearing about how, for instance, we need, you know, we're, we're destroying the environment with all of our, our agriculture and this, that and the other. And we're always hearing, oh, okay, well, we need to do less of this and less of the other. And, you know, obviously, as a vegan, I agree with eating less meat, but I don't agree with it from the point of view of the environment. I'm an ethical vegan, not an environmental vegan. But one thing that's never mentioned is, well, why don't we all start growing our own food? You know, why don't we have lessons in schools uh, if it's such a problem, all of this massive destructive agriculture, then why don't we have lessons in school where you teach people to grow their own food and teach them to grow their own organic fruits and vegetables, etc.? This seems to me like a really obvious thing, but you know we're never going to be teaching people these things in schools because the system wants us to be dependent on it. Which is again, as you were saying, um, big pharma coming in and saying, you know, we're gonna. Um, be the substitute for your immune system now and now you just come to us for a jab every three to six months and you know don't worry about it don't worry about your health we'll just provide you a vaccine for this that or the other um, is just another manifestation of this exact same uh, problem which is um, big industry and governments coming together to force our dependence on them yeah definitely and something that we should point people in the direction of like if you're trying to bring an extinction rebellion person around you know, to, to, you know, to your, I mean, they are pretty nutty, a lot of them, but I mean, if you can give them something real, like, you know, if you show them, like, we are building, we're like, here's a movement, which is actually doing something and it's actually creating sustainable produce. Like that's something real and they can't disagree with that. They can't. And so I think, but when it kind of gets caught up in these, yeah, they're too, like, if we don't, if we just push back against the main narrative without building a proper alternative, then it, we're kind of caught up in these, um, in this sort of divide and conquer. But if you actually create something real, like you suggested, then it just becomes much more straightforward. It's like, tell me what you don't like about what we're doing here. Seems like we're kind of aligned on, you know, on our goal and what we're trying to achieve out of this. Yeah, that is 
a super important thing. We have to stay positive, present a vision of the future and bring people on board. And I'm not, I don't want to butcher the quote, but it goes something like, don't focus on destroying the old, focus on building the new. And I do think that that's starting to happen, which is a really positive yeah. thing to see. So with that said, um, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Um, I'm sure there'll be more to come in the future. Um, do you want to just tell everyone where they can find you and maybe just tell them a little bit about um, not the BBC as well? I'm assuming that you're you're still going with the channel. There's some great yeah. interviews on there, which I can highly recommend that people check out. So yeah, tell people about that and uh, where else to find you. Well, yeah, firstly, thanks a lot for having me on. I, I really enjoyed that. I'm glad you're doing this. Like you said, uh, the kind of we do need to create a space where people can just think out loud and kind of synthesize some of the, some of the learnings can take a step back. Like if, if it just ends up in some, like just ends up us all venting in Twitter, then you just kind of go around in circles. You could literally be in Twitter for an eternity and not get anywhere. So thanks for making the space and for, for inviting me on in terms of, um, in terms of following me, you can find not the BBC just by typing that in on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter. If you type not the BBC, you'll find me, but it's, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm listed under my name, which is Seb Abekasis. Um, and what I do with Not The BBC is I try and kind of straddle the activism side of things with taking a step back and understanding a bit more deeply about kind of why things are happening. Um, like where are we historically? Um, what are the kind of, what's interesting about these new technologies? What do they mean? And, and what do we practically need to do? Um, so I kind of try and straddle the line between a bit more abstract thinking and the kind of day-to-day -day activism. So you can find me there. Thanks so much. Speak soon. Cheers, Johnny. <laughs>